Well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bob James. Um, for those of you who do know me, it's probably from a passion for angling, which just sort of turned into something far bigger than we ever imagined it was going to when we started doing it, which is lovely. Uh, I'm very pleased for it. Thank you very much indeed, all of you who contributed in any way or just sat and watched it. It was a statement of how we felt fishing is, hopefully, will continue to be. And on my front, people say, well, what have you done since Passion for Angling? Well, life changed a bit after Passion for Angling. Um, <laughs> I suppose you become a bit of a minor celebrity, really, which means you can't go fishing in some of your old favourite haunts because everyone wants to come and talk to you, which is lovely, but not much good for the fishing. I never actually got involved with anything that big again. There was never going to be a Passion for Angling too. Uh, it was a statement, the statement was made, uh, it took a long time out of our lives, but we're all much older now. Um, uh, Hugh was the genius behind it, and I think deserves so much of the credit. Uh, and he's gone on to make some other fishy things, he really got the taste for it, which is lovely. I did a lot of magazine work off the back of that. I did a lot of club talks, I did a lot of after dinner speeches, which I used to love, especially if you've got a couple of hecklers. That's really good sport. Uh, and I did quite a lot of, of travelling abroad, which was nice, and made some bits of stuff for travel documentaries and some stuff in America. Um, so life has been good. Uh, it's been very different, <laughs> but good. Uh, and basically all off the, the back of passion. The, um, the question that's so often asked is, did I ever catch Harry, the carp in the last program and the answer I'm afraid is no. Uh, I went back and caught a few fish from that lake very briefly uh, and then seemed to sort of wander off into other things in my life uh, and yet oddly enough just literally in the last few months I've actually been in contact with the estate again and, uh, and I may even after all these years return because uh, it is something that's stayed in my, in my dreams. Uh, um, it's such a mysterious place but as regards the actual reality of, of what happened, uh, there's, there was a lot of standout bits. Uh, obviously going to Redmar with Chris was a huge privilege. It, the, the history of, of Redmar is huge uh, around Chris's era. He and Rod really changed things from the old historic sort of days. Going to the Spay, salmon fishing and failing. <laughs> That's the sort of memory you probably don't want. But there you go, salmon fishing's a strange old game. No fresh fish, nothing gets caught. But great, lovely experience. Met some lovely, lovely people up there. Uh, and boringly, I guess, the roach catch has got to be the most memorable bit. He was always hoping that by some fate of Isaac Wharton that we would catch a record fish during the filming. Well, we tried, uh, but never quite got that far. But certainly that was the biggest haul of roach that that I've ever had. I've had some quite good hauls of roach in the past, but that one just kind of superseded everything. And, and, and I think stood out for an awful lot of people. And a lot of people actually quite liked the pike because I sort of snuck in and caught a couple of pike while Chris was still in bed, which was a bit of fun. I, I think when people sit and watch fishing films, they think that we just turn up and go fishing for the day and someone secretly is sort of hiding somewhere and just films the whole thing and then we have a cup of tea and go home. Um, it, it, it certainly wasn't quite that simple 30 years ago when we made Passion, which was all made on film for a start. So there were 20 minute rolls of film that every 20 minutes had to be changed. And if you just cast into a tree, that was another roll of film that <laughs> was useless. So th there was a pressure. Um, Hugh uh, was a very exacting person to work for, uh, but then the beauty of the product reflects that. You, know, you can freeze frame Passion for Angling at any moment and you've got a portrait, you've got a composed picture, it's not one of these things that's all over the place, it's beautifully crafted as, as Hugh's work would be from, from what he'd done in the past. But it, it does make it quite hard when you've only got one cameraman, because for a start, you catch a fish, then he'll say, well that was great, could you catch me another one of the same size from the same swim this time tomorrow so I can film it from a different angle? Yes, of course I can do, as long as the weather's the same, but the next day the weather wouldn't be the same. So time sort of marched past. And, uh, and I learned a lot. I learned a lot from the sheer application of that man to just keep going until you get exactly what you want. Um, to make something like that these days would have taken nothing like that same amount of time because of all the technology and stuff you've got. 
but then of course the, anything that you did would be recorded whereas some of the time we'd do a lovely take and then he would go ah I forgot to turn the tape recorder on so we'd do it again um, so there was a lot of laughs people say well what, what happened to the outtakes well there, there weren't any really you know, our cock cuts were still in there we cast in trees we jumped out of trees um, but yeah, what more do you want we didn't actually sort of have any bigger no one fell in so there was no you know, outtake for that one so generally you actually saw what went on over a period of time uh, and it was a lot of fun and there's some great memories from it I think, again, a lot of people think, well, how much did it change my fishing? Did it change my fishing life? I think it changed my, my public life. I don't think it actually ever changed my fishing life. I think I'd still have the same um, things that turn me on, the same things that, that I adore going back to. And I think people often ask, I've heard this question asked so many times of Dick Walker in the past, of John Wilson when John was still around, what's your favorite fishing? What is you know, your, your end goal? What if you got stuck? having to do one sort of fishing, what would you do? And certainly for me, and it was certainly true for John, it was certainly true for Dick, because I've heard them come up with the same answer. It would be a very nice 13 foot float rod, a good centre pin, probably some three pound line, a reasonable sized stick float, and a nice loaf of bread on a chalk stream, trotting for roach. It's a style of fishing that, that's still an art, that's never become a science, you know. Hair rigs won't help you out, bolt rigs won't help you out, mass baiting won't help you out. You, it's something you still have to, have that understanding of the river, you have to have that feel for moving the float down through the flow at the right pace so the roach won't be suspicious. It's an art, and I think that in itself makes it something quite unique. And, and talking of um, uh, Richard Walker and, and, and many of the other things, it's another one, so much of, of, I think, what somebody like myself does, or probably so much of what passion was around, is a huge accumulation over years of all the influences you've had from reading, people you've actually met, places you've actually been. And it's quite interesting for me because actually most of my influences in my fishing weren't specimen hunters. I think I'm generally thought of as a specimen hunter. I do like to catch bigger than average fish. But equally, I do like to catch fish. I'm not one of these people who can sit somewhere for a week to get one bite to catch an enormous tench. I'd love to catch one in the middle of a bag of tench. <laughs> it would be much nicer. So more of my influences were match anglers. A very early influence for me was Billy Lane. I thought he was a great character. I loved the way he won the world championships float fishing. Um, and so those sort of characters who, who actually make the fishing work. I, I've had the privilege of fishing with Bob Nudd quite a lot of times, albeit at game fairs and, and so on. But you're there. Ian Heaps was somebody, I, I think he was probably the first person I've did an angling demonstration with. And he sort of said he was going to do his continental grain, ground bait bombardment. W would I demonstrate trotting with a stick float and some bread? Yeah, that'd be great. But of course I was green. So I spent a lot of time describing my shot pattern and how I was putting my bread on, by which time Ian had caught about three fish. So the penny dropped, I thought, I'd better start catching some fish. So I caught a few, and come the end of the, the demo, I said to Ian, I thought it was meant to be a sort of demonstration, you know, to describe our techniques. And he said, well, it is, but whose technique do you think they're going to remember? <laughs> so you kind of learn lessons from those guys. They're, they're switched on. I, I love the old attitude of just wander down the river and, you know, watch the river go by. But you don't have to take a fishing rod to do that. Once I'm there and I've got a fishing rod, I, I do become a little bit committed, to be honest. And I, and I think, looking back, most of my, my influence is, were anglers of that sort of ilk. So sort of speaking of which, you know, what's my favourite things to do, which are my favourite places and so on. I, I've sat here on this bit of the River Wine now for the best part of 20 years. Uh, I, I first came up here with Chris Yates and John Bailey when we heard there were barbel up this end of the River Wine. It was very difficult, almost impossible to get anyone to give us permission to fish. They all thought we were going to try and pinch their salmon, I think. What salmon, you might ask. Um, we first got on at Breadwood Dean. Uh, that, that lasted quite a lot of years. But then over the period of time, I found various different people who'd let me on when they weren't salmon fishing and so on. And, and somehow by fate, I ended up here, which if I could have any stretch of the river wide, this is the stretch I'd have. So how, how good can that be? I must have done something right in my life at some point or other. And it, it's because it, it's just so archetypal, beautiful English countryside. It's such a lovely place to come and sit. I've got all the species of fish, really. I'm at the sort of 
bottom end of the trout fishing and the grey loo fishing, I'm at the top end of the coarse fishing. So I literally have every species going, swimming backwards and forwards through this bit of river. I love that. I love in the spring, we, you know, we have the salmon coming through, we have the shad coming through. I love watching the sea lamprey following the salmon up. I mean, they're awesome creatures. You, you don't fish for them, you certainly wouldn't want to pick one up and have to unhook it anyway. And then during the summer, you know, I've got my, my barbel and I've got my chub, and then through the winter, the pike fishing is clearly absolutely awesome because it's such a larder. It's like a food larder for a pike. This is, they must think they've gone to heaven if, uh, when they arrive here. So it, it's the combination of all those things and the fact that the river varies so much every time it goes around a bend, it'll run through some more rapids, it gets a bit of oxygen in it, it drops into a slow bend. And interestingly, you get people who sort of dictate, you know, what sort of water you've got to look for for what sort of fish. You know, I don't really find that's quite as black and white as they might like to imagine. I can fish a swim that's two foot deep and catch a marble and I can move 100 yards down and fish to swim four foot deep, it's going a bit slower. And I can sit on a slow old bend that's seven foot deep, and amazingly, I still catch barbel. Maybe they're a bit like us, they don't all like the same things. I, I think everybody tends to group animals, particularly fish, as just being pretty stupid and just all sort of hang out together, not thinking. Fish actually change a lot through the course of the season, through the difference in the, the conditions. And, and the lovely thing about a river like this is, of course, this river, I've known this river come up eight foot in a day. That changes everything pretty dramatically. So you're, all, you're always at the mercies of nature fishing a big river like this. You, you can never completely master it because it will just slap you in the face and change. One was lucky, two's a little bit less lucky, a bit more skillful, plus the right time of the day. You can sit there all afternoon sometimes and these little beauties will just completely ignore you. And suddenly it's tea time. Beautiful. Almost the twin of your mate. It's um it's not somewhere you'd come if you were trying to sort of break records. I, I wonder whether the Y will ever do that. It did it many years ago, the pike record, but even that now has been so sort of superseded by fish from trout reservoirs. Um, but there's so many fish, there's so many different year classes of fish. And it amazes me really that something like the chub have got as big as they have over the years that I've been here now. And we, we now catch chub over seven pounds. When I came here, you know, a four pounder was a good one, a five pounder. You, you sort of wrote back to your mum tell, to tell her about it. So the average size of the chub has gone up and up and up. But it's so lovely because you've got then about three different year classes underneath that, which suggests it's still such a hit, such a unpolluted, such a healthy environment. It's one of the few rivers, I suppose, in the country that's never had any big industry on it. So it's never had to sort of recover. It's just stayed in a very nice balance as things are. I mean, even if you venture into something as controversial as otters, I've had otters on this stretch ever since I've been here. They were here before me, they'll be here after me. But that balance on a river like this, has been established years and years ago. It's only when people start interfering maybe putting too many fish in, maybe putting too many otters in, but they're interfering. It's very dangerous to try and correct nature when you think it's wrong in just a little short space of time. It takes a long time. And the lovely thing about something like here is it's had a long time to settle down. And I've watched for 20 years now as it's changed, the pastures have changed. This used to be a dairy farm. The cows eat everything down. Now it's not, it's arable, so now everything grows. So the bank side has changed. It's, it's lovely to watch how nature changes itself and evolves and uses what's there. Whereas we think we can come along and dictate it. Hey, we can't and please don't. I, I sort of touch loosely on, on the fact people think, you know, oh, that's a bit of barbed water, that's not, which is fairly dangerous. Go and fish it and, and watch. You know, I've avoided one or two embarrassing moments up here in the past when I've had people up fishing. And I remember early on when I had it and a chap sat on a very slow bend in the middle of a sort of hot sunny day. And, probably thought 
he was going to catch some bream or something. I, I was just going to walk up to him and say, look, I'm not sure this is the best spot you could fish. Perhaps you should, you know, move a bit. I said, you know, oh, how are you getting on? Oh, brilliant. He said, I've had eight. <laughs> Barbel, that is, not bream. And you think, lucky I didn't sort of offer too much advice. It's always a bit dodgy. And, it, and it's the same with how to fish. I think 50% of how to fish is to fish with a method you like, a method you enjoy for a start. And, and again, that's another thing that changes continually. I've been a great advocate for years at the beginning of the season that you'll get more barbel on a moving bait than you ever will on the static bait. That can be trotted through, but it can also be fished with a big nymph. One of the best ways to catch barbel up here when everyone moans the barbel fishing is no good for the first couple of weeks of the season. It's just to fish a big heavy leaded nymph, get out there and check nymph it. Just go and virtually stand next to them and work the nymph. It's a great way to do it. If you want to sit there and, and have a almost like a carp fishing session if you want, we put out a couple of feeders. It's a very successful way of fishing the river. I ball in a load of ground bait and then I put quite a lot of freebies in and I make a cup of tea and then I'll probably put some more ground bait in and then I'll set my rod up. <laughs> and it's back to that whole thing of, of building the swim. That's a great way to fish but it may not suit your temperament. You might want to go along and put a few pellets underneath a few different trees, creep along, catch a couple, put some more pellet and go away to another spot for a little while. There's, there are no hard and fast rules. You, you must do what you, you want to do, what you enjoy doing in the first instance. But secondly, the thing changes throughout the seasons. You know, the water's lovely and clear here during the summer. In the winter, it gets quite coloured. The fish will be tucking themselves in the edges. Great big pieces of stinky bait tucked in the edge it worked great so just try and adapt what you're doing to the c conditions that you can see in front of you and, and then you can continue to catch fish there's no one method that would concede or sorry will succeed throughout the whole season as the conditions change years ago uh, traveling for fishing must have been quite difficult really certainly my traveling for fishing was quite difficult when i was first allowed to go out it meant sort of getting a bus to an underground station, getting out of London and getting another bus at the other end, which with the fishing tackle was all a bit cumbersome, really. And at the time, Richard Walker, to bring him back into it, was catching the record car from a lovely, lovely estate lake near Ross on Wyatt. But he lived in Hitchin. And some people said, oh, well, that's, you know, that's not really fair. You know, I, I don't have a car and so on. And you're always going to get people who are going to criticise you for pushing the boundaries a bit. Uh, and that was true time-wise as well. When I first started carp fishing back in the 60s and 70s, uh, I fished down in Kent with a great character called Bruce Ashby. We used to try and fish every weekend, and we even tried fishing one night during the week for a while. And we got accused of being time bandits. You know, our fish didn't count because we were putting so much time in. And all that just changes continually. And my generation has been very lucky. The whole world's opened up for fishing. Travel has become easy, travel has become far less expensive. And I've been really lucky with some of the companies that I work for, some of the other countries I've managed to get to to go fishing. And oh, how long could I sit here and tell you of some of the things that I've enjoyed? You know, I enjoyed the best pro circuit in America. I, I enjoyed the, the terribly focused in attitude you have to have towards that sort of fishing. Completely in contrast to the sort of laid back fishing that I was used to in this country. Once you've done a, a bit of sort of traveling around, you really get addicted to some of the other things. That warm saltwater fly fishing i mean that is just magical and the speed and the power of the fish that live in those sort of environments uh, i ended up fishing for bonefish in the seychelles um mainly because i was lucky enough to go there to get married and i'm often criticized because apparently i fished every day but one on my honeymoon um, but hey you know <laughs> it was my honeymoon as well we did something else in the evenings <laughs> and, and i i loved some of that sort of variety that uh, fishing was brought into my life and some of those sort of crazy places that you end up going. Um, some of them not so warm, you know, we've been up sort of Lapland. I think um, Charles Jardine and I were one of the first little groups of people who were actually allowed to go up into Lapland and go fishing. Um, absolutely amazing Arctic char. I mean, the stunning colours of an Arctic char when you first land it, but it's only for moments, then you have to put it back in the water because you can see the colours starting to go from it. He has to be back in his environment. It, it's a it's a massive feast that, uh, throughout the whole world now uh, that we go fishing for. Uh, and the variety of methods that you use, uh, fishing off beaches in Gambia. I mean, how crazy is that? You know, you're sort of wading out up to your armpits and then you suddenly realise the sharks are swimming between you and the beach. So you get out pretty quick. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely, 
ongoing saga for me, that one. These days people go on about a bucket list. I've never quite understood what a bucket list. I, I, I know that what they're talking about is this list of things I want to do, but why it's a bucket list, I've not been quite sure, but someone will let me know on that one. Uh, I've been very lucky. I've probably done most of the things that were on my so-called bucket list. If anything now, I probably want to go back and do one or two of the things that I did in the hope that I could probably do them a bit better than I did the first time around. That's certainly true of one or two beautiful old carp estate lakes that I fished. Uh, unfortunately, in one or two of them, I, I am actually going back to fish over the next couple of years. As regards to sort of whizzing off around the world and so on, I've got to be honest, I've become a bit too long in the tooth for it. Um, travel is not as glamorous as it used to be for me. Airports are not even a particularly nice place to be, to be honest with you. So I'm a very contented person now. My, my bucket list probably comprises of, of being back here tomorrow with a nice cup of tea and, uh, and a lovely weather, the river in perfect condition, and, and just catch a few more fish. Maybe bring some more people down here and show them the glory and the beauty of it and share it with them. That's my bucket list.